So for today's movie review, I'll be reviewing Jurassic World Dominion, the overall sixth installment in the Jurassic franchise, but the third installment in the Jurassic World trilogy. A trilogy that has a lot of similarities with the Disney Star Wars trilogy, with the first installment, that being Jurassic World and Force Awakens, being a soft reboot that manages to be a nostalgia-filled crowd pleaser, with the criticism being that they have some plot points that are a bit too similar to their first installments, while the second installment of the trilogy, Fallen Kingdom and The Last Jedi, getting directed by a different director, resulting in the movie being both dark and different compared to the first installment, but resulting in the movie getting heavy criticism to a point where the respective fan base for both franchises considered that installment to be the worst installment of the entire franchise, while the third and final installment for both trilogies, Dominion and and The Rise of Skywalker being an installment that's directed by the same person who directed the first installment of said trilogies despite stating that they would never direct another installment of said franchise, resulting in the movie essentially being a fanfic that tries to conclude the story arc that not only was started in the first installment of this trilogy, but also tries to serve as a concluding installment of the entire franchise, resulting in the movie in question getting a common criticism among the lines of the franchise has run its course with this installment, often getting hailed as the worst installment of the franchise. So naturally, I decided to review this movie since I already did reviews for the first two installments of the Jurassic World trilogy, so I might as well throw in my two cents on this installment of the franchise. Wondering, was Jurassic World Dominion really that bad? As for the plot of the movie, four years after the destruction of of Isla Nublar and dinosaurs now living across the world, Claire and Owen do their best to take care of the clone girl Maisie, but in doing so results in her getting kidnapped, and the two proceed to go on a rescue mission. And discovering the ones responsible for Maisie's kidnapping is the genetics company Biosyn. Meanwhile, Dr. Grant and Ali Sattler team up once more to uncover the mystery revolved around a giant swarm of locusts eating crops across the United States, and try to uncover the origin behind their creation, only to discover that the ones responsible for the creation of the locusts is none other than Biosyn. Can our two groups of heroes rescue the clone girl and put an end to Biosyn, or will Biosyn's swarm of giant locusts result in the extinction of both humans and dinosaurs? Now, before I go any further, I'm going to tackle my review a little differently, because I'm not only reviewing just a theatrical cut, but I'm also including the extended cut of the movie as well. And the way I'm going to be structuring that, I am predominantly going to be talking about the theatrical cut first, and then touch upon the extended cut later later in review before I gave my final verdict to see whether or not having the extended cut was worth it or not. But without further ado, in terms of what I liked about the movie, if there's one thing that Jurassic World Dominion does better than the entirety of the Star Wars Disney trilogy is that they managed to get the original cast from the first Jurassic Park movie and reunite them and having them interact with the newer cast from the Jurassic World movies. Another aspect of the movie I really liked is the sound design, everything from the soundtrack to the sound effects. One scene that really does a good showcase of, well, music and sound effects is during the part of the movie where Claire has her encounter with the Venusinosaurus, because the music really does build up this creepy atmosphere. And as far as the sound effects are concerned, given that the Venusinosaurus itself is blind, I do like the fact that you can hear it using echolocation to move around, and the sound effect used for that particular sequence I thought was otherworldly in a good kind of way. Another aspect of the movie I really liked is the way the dinosaurs are depicted in the movie, in that sense where in the past several movies they always have been depicted as monsters. With the exception of the original movie, every other Jurassic Park or Jurassic World movie always had them being depicted as being monstrous in nature, whereas the dinosaurs in this movie are depicted more naturalistically. For example, take the part where Owen and the, I honestly forget the character's name, but the airplane pilot first witness the interaction between the T-Rex and Giganotosaurus fighting over the deer carcass. When the two predators fight each other, it's not really a fight to the death. 
more of a squabble in that sense where you have the T-Rex and Giganotosaurus not only fighting over the deer carcass, but the Giganotosaurus wants it, asserts its dominance over the T-Rex. It doesn't chase after a T-Rex. Instead, it allows the T-Rex to leave, showcasing some territorial behavior, something that you would see in modern day animals. Another aspect of the movie I liked is how the movie showcases just how far we've come from depicting dinosaurs from the original Jurassic Park movie all the way up to this movie. Because remember, the dinosaurs depicted in the original Jurassic Park movie were at the time considered accurate representations of dinosaurs based off what we knew of them at the time, even though by today's standards they're considered to be scientifically inaccurate. But at the same time, within the context of the movie, there is an enormous explanation behind why they look the way they do. Given that the dinosaurs weren't 100% authentic, they had to, the scientists had to use some modern animal DNA to make the dinosaurs in question. Remember, they even acknowledged this in the original Jurassic World movie where Dr. Wu said, nothing in Jurassic World is natural. All of the dinosaurs that we create in some shape or form had DNA from modern animals, such as amphibians or reptiles, which is why they look the way they do. They aren't accurate. Fast forward to this movie, when you have Dr. Grant, Ellie Salar, in the biosyn facility, you actually have the wild scientists going, we are so far advanced with the technology that we don't need to mix modern animal DNA with the dinosaur to make a 100% scientifically accurate dinosaur. As we do see throughout the movie that there are clearly some dinosaurs that have feathers to them. And I actually do like the fact that this movie does mix a lot of the dinosaurs that are scientifically inaccurate with ones that are scientifically accurate, relatively speaking. Another aspect of the movie I liked is the whole Malta sequence for several reasons. One reason being that it's set in a different geographical location because up to this point in the franchise between Jurassic Park up to the first half of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, most of those movies have either taken place on Isla Nublar or Isla Sorna. Sure, Lost World Jurassic Park and the second half of Fallen Kingdom do have the dinosaurs interacting with some urban environments for one scene. And while technically the whole Malta sequence is just that dinosaurs interacting with a geographical location for one scene it's not set in America it's set somewhere in Europe which I thought was refreshing given that anytime we have seen dinosaurs let loose on an urban environment in some of the previous movies it was always on mainland United States and on top of that we get to see a fully functioning black market because technically we've already seen a black market type scenario play out in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, but whereas that was an auction, this here, it feels more lived in, like totally do by the fact that on top of having these different vendors illegally selling all these different dinosaurs, either as pets, sport, food, but I also like the fact that we also show like how the dinosaurs are utilized in that scene, especially at points in time where we cut back to like the pit fight scenes where we actually have People bid on which dinosaur is gonna kill one another in like a dog fight kind of way. And the entire sequence itself I thought was entertaining from start to finish. Another aspect of the movie I liked is how unintentionally funny the movie can be at times. Because there's either some lines of dialogue or a scenario plays out where I just burst out laughing because I couldn't believe it happened. Uh, for example, going back to the Malta sequence when you have the Conator and the Allosaurus let loose in the whole entire black market. Yeah, you got some people running around getting eaten by the two, but then there's like a point where you have Chris Pratt fighting one of the poachers earlier in the movie in like the pit fight scene and you have everyone crowd around them going yeah yeah meanwhile in the background you have the all sourcing and Carnotaur just wrecking shop literally eating people without them noticing it, it's hilarious or another unintentionally funny scene I just thought of is near the end of the movie where you have a Clara being cornered by a Dilophosaurus and you have Owen knocking the, the dinosaur out and I'm sorry this entire sequence is so funny because First off, it's Owen choke holding a dinosaur to knock it out. Second, from a, like a technical standpoint, it just looks as if Chris Pratt grabbed a hold of the Dilophosaurus animatronic and took it off the puppeteer's hand. It, it just looks so unintentionally funny. I can't help but laugh at it. And another aspect of the movie I liked is the special effects, from the CGI to the practical effects. The CGI, to me, is on point, looks just as good as it did in the other two Jurassic World movies. And as far as the practical effects are concerned, I do like the fact that they're 
so much practical effects throughout this movie because my biggest complaint with the original Jurassic World movie was that there wasn't too many practical effects even though there are points in time where I started going that could have been a practical effect that could have been a practical effect and that could have been a practical effect Fallen Kingdom definitely corrected this where we actually do see a lot more practical effects this movie is no exception we definitely see a lot more practical effects everything from the Tylosaurus a diametric dawn to even a fully giant sized animatronic of the Giganotosaurus. Although that said, I think a lot of the practical effects were done and executed better in Fallen Kingdom than they were here because anytime I saw the actual practical effects for some of the dinosaurs in this movie, it didn't look like the type of effects we saw back in the original Jurassic Park movie. Instead, a lot of the animatronics in this movie reminded me a lot of the type of animatronics we saw from the company Dynamation. Long story short, if you're someone who doesn't know what Dynamation is, during the late 80s, early 90s, there was this company that basically created and sold its own dinosaur animatronics to museums that sadly no longer exists. And that's what a good majority of these animatronics reminded me of. That said, however, I still do appreciate that the filmmakers did go out of their way to include a lot more animatronic dinosaurs for this particular movie. With the Giganotosaurus animatronic being, in my opinion, the most impressive of the animatronics we do see throughout the movie. Now, in terms of aspects of the movie I have mixed feelings on, the actual plot itself, in terms of having one half of the movie focus on the original cast and have the other half of the movie focus on the newer cast and going back and forth between these two plot lines, I thought it was a the idea, but I think the execution wasn't handled very well. Because I think the biggest problem with these plot lines are that they're not paced very well. Because I get what the filmmakers were trying to do by replicating that Stranger Things formula where you start the story off by having multiple storylines and as the story progresses each and every single storyline in and of itself is its own movie that are all interconnected that all later converge into one story and when you look at the storylines within Jurassic World Dominion, they're really ridiculous because you got the one storyline with the original cast, which comes down to it being a spy espionage thriller, whereas the plotline revolved around the newer cast is one part Fast and Furious movie mixed with the Liam Neeson movie Taken. And both are influenced by the Locusts, which I'll get to in a few minutes. And why I think the pacing to these two storylines aren't properly handled is that when you really watch the movie, it doesn't flow like a movie. It feels as if there were several episodes of an unmade live-action Jurassic World TV show that all got spliced together to make a movie. That's what the general structure of this movie felt like to me. And in some ways reminded me of Pacific Rim Uprising in that sense where when you watch that movie, there is no real flow in a narrative sense. And because it didn't feel like an actual movie, it just felt like several episodes of a TV show spliced together. That's what Jurassic World Dominion feels feels like. So on pen and paper, I actually do like the idea that you give a starline to both the cast from the original movie and the cast from the Jurassic World movies. I just think it could have been executed better. Another aspect of the movie I have mixed feelings on revolve around the locusts. Because on the one hand, by having the movie introduce the swarm of giant locusts, it's definitely something that's new and different that we've never seen before within the franchise. And their inclusion into the movie itself is ridiculous both good and bad. Good in that sense where it was generally a plot point I did not expect from this movie, but the reason why I also think it's ridiculous in a bad kind of way, it has the most influence over the movie's narrative for really dumb reasons. And because of the inclusion of the locusts, it's become a very infamous plot point that people have pointed out time and time again in their own reviews of the movie which I think are kind of misleading because when you look into a lot of reviews for the movie back when it first came out, a lot of people pretty much straight up said, the movie is about the locusts. And the way they described it, they described it more as a giant killer bug movie than anything else. And I kind of get where they're coming from because the locusts themselves 
have the most influence over the narrative of the movie for really dumb reasons. But my problem with some of those criticisms are that when people talked about the movie, they just described it as a giant killer bug movie. And while I definitely see where they're coming from because the locusts have the most influence over the narrative, it still has plenty of dinosaur action. It does know when and how to showcase the dinosaurs within the movie. Although, that said, I would have handled the Locust subplot really differently by, first off, not including it. Instead, I would have had the movie revolve around some type of prehistoric parasite that's causing a mass extinction event that's killing off plants, animals, humans, dinosaurs, and you have the cast from both the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World movies trying to figure out how can they stop this prehistoric parasite and save both humans and dinosaurs alike. That that's what I would have done differently, instead of having it be about the locusts. And before I go any further, I know what you're thinking. This sounds exactly the same as the plot with the locusts. But here's where I would come in and tell you why my idea is different from the movies. Because as the movie sits, the reason why the locusts exist is really stupid because it just comes down to Dawson being this greedy Biosyn CEO who wants money. And what better way to make money than by forcing everybody to buy their products? Because if they don't, then the swarm of locusts are going to eat product that wasn't produced by Biosyn which is the dumbest reason for the locusts to exist in the first place. With my parasite idea, it would be a completely different story because the parasites wouldn't be a man-made entity. Instead, it'd be something that the Earth itself created as a reaction to having all of these dinosaurs exist as a negative consequence. That way, there's a more natural explanation behind it, because originally when I saw the TV spots with the locusts, my original thought was, is this the Earth reacting to the fact that dinosaurs now exist in a modern day in a very negative kind of way? That, I thought, would have been a very interesting concept idea to do for a movie. But nope, the locust just exists so that Dawson can make more money while unintentionally destroying the food chain. Another aspect of the movie I have mixed feelings on is the inclusion of Dawson. Because this is a character that first appeared in the books, who made a brief cameo in the original Jurassic Park movie, so I do like the fact that the character has reappeared once again since we haven't seen him since the original movie. So I do like his inclusion, I just don't think he was written particularly very well as a villain. Because the way they have written him in the movie, I think he's just a wee bit too polite. And because of that, he's just one big pushover who constantly had temper tantrums throughout the movie and made some really dumb mistakes. And the way I think he should have been written, he should have been more intimidating in that sense where anytime he showed up interacting with one of our main characters, there should have been a sense of dread to him because you don't know what he's going to say or do to our main character. Because even though he doesn't really appear much in the first book, he definitely is a major part of the second book. And he's really despicable in that second book. And if they made Dawson in this movie more like his counterpart from the book, I think that would have worked out a lot better. And I also like his death scene in terms of how it ties back to the original movie in a very clever way. Sure, I do have a problem with it, which I'll address later, but I think it was clever in a ironic kind of way. Another aspect of the movie I have mixed feelings on are the dinosaurs themselves. Because much like Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, this movie also has a huge variety of not just dinosaurs, but other prehistoric creatures as well. As aptly mentioned, we see new species of dinosaur ranging from the likes of the Necroceratops, Dregnotus, and my favorite of the bunch, the Venezinosaurus, to some of the other prehistoric creatures like the Quetzalcoatlus, the Locusts, and one of my favorite prehistoric creatures, the Dimetrodon. My problem with the dinosaurs in this movie are the way they're incorporated into the plot. Because to me, it just felt like the filmmakers went, okay, we're going to have this dinosaur show up at this scene for five minutes. Then several minutes later, we get introduced to another dinosaur for another five minutes that only shows up for this one scene. Rinse, wash, repeat, and you get my point. Another aspect of the movie I have mixed feelings on is Maisie's origin. Because in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, when Lockwood established that Maisie's mother attended the first Jurassic Park, this raised 
questions at the time, and I started thinking, wait, who is this girl's mother? Because the way they implied it, it sounded as if Maisie's mother, who turns out to be really Charlotte Lockwood, it almost seemed as if this particular character took part in the events of the first movie. And when we do learn more about Charlotte Lockwood in the movie, the explanation they give actually made sense in terms of how she was able to attend the first Jurassic Park. In that sense where she mainly lived on Isla Sorna, helping out the scientists producing the dinosaurs for Isla Nublar, and she periodically visited Site A and helped out from a behind-the-scenes kind of way, which to me made sense. But then when it came to the actual plot twist of Charlotte Lockwood actually sexually produced Maisie, that's where things got out of hand in my opinion because this is just one massive retcon from Fallen Kingdom because in Fallen Kingdom it was established that Lockwood's daughter died in a car accident and the reason why him and Hammond parted ways was because Lockwood made a clone of his own daughter but in this movie they retconned that and have it turn out that Charlotte Lockwood was the one that cloned Maisie through sexual reproduction and died of a genetic disease and the car accident was a cover-up that I thought was really dumb. And as for the last aspects of the movie I have mixed feelings on is that climax where you have the three-way face-off between the T-Rex, the Giganotosaurus, and the Venusaurus. Because at the time of the movie's release, a lot of people really complained about the climax basically being a repeat of the climax from Jurassic World. Just replaced Blue the Velociraptor and the Indominus Rex with the Venusaurus and the Giganotosaurus. Which I kind of find to be funny because if you look at a lot of the concept art for for the final battle, that Venusaurus wasn't even supposed to be there. Originally, the Pyroraptor was supposed to show up as the wild card, but I think that even the filmmakers knew, okay, this is way too similar to the climax to Jurassic World, so why don't we replace the Pyroraptor with a Venusaurus, which I thought worked out much better in some ways, because when you look at all of the climaxes to the Jurassic Park or Jurassic World movies, most of them revolve around either people confronting a carnivorous dinosaur, or you have just one carnivorous dinosaur battling another carnivorous dinosaur. So I do find it refreshing that here's a climax where you have a more carnivorous dinosaur fight against a carnivorous dinosaur, which I thought was refreshing. But other than that, the execution of the fight itself was not handled very well, because honestly, there's no build-up to that fight whatsoever. And second, it is poorly lit to a point where I couldn't tell which dinosaur was the T-Rex or the Giganotosaurus? I just saw two big, giant creatures fight each other in shadow and nothing else. And also, on top of that, I do hate how the camera just focused on the people the entire time, where you have the dinosaurs duking on the background, because you couldn't see what was going on, because the camera was focused more on the people than it was the dinosaurs. And on top of that, when you actually do have the T-Rex and the Venusaurus tag team with the Giganotosaurus, first off, it's not only anticlimactic, but it's also super short. Now, in terms of what I disliked about the movie, easily one of the biggest problems that this movie commits is by giving our main cast of characters so much plot armor that it breaks all suspension of disbelief. Because back in the first Jurassic Park movie, yes, some of our main cast of characters survive, but none of them had any plot armor. Ian Malcolm gets injured by the T-Rex, him gets electrocuted, Ellie Sattler is seen limping after her encounter with the Velociraptor in the bunker, and the reason why that movie worked is because A, none of the characters had plot armor, and B, because the characters had no plot armor, this created a lot of suspense seen throughout the movie. Even in some of the lesser installments of the Jurassic Park franchise, such as Lost World or Jurassic Park 3, we see a lot of those characters, doesn't matter if they're the type of characters you're rooting for or rooting against, they all either get injured or eaten because they don't have any plot armor. With Jurassic World the Mini, on the other hand, because the characters have so much plot armor, there is no suspense, because you know that they're all going to survive. For example, when our main cast of characters encounter the Giganotosaurus near the end of the movie, no one gets eaten nor injured. And the way that scene plays out is so ridiculous because you have this gigantic theropod dinosaur not chasing after our main cast characters it's casually walking towards them not sure for all i know maybe the giganotosaurus had never seen a person before and was just really curious but as that entire scene plays out the giganotosaurus had multiple opportunities to either injure or eat one of our main cast of characters but it chose not 
want to because our main cast of characters had thick plot armor. Even when we see it chase after them, it's not really running after them, it's more walking towards them. It was so ridiculous. It reminded me of this one scene from this 1977 Japanese American produced dinosaur movie called The Last Dinosaur, where anytime our main cast of characters encountered a T Rex in that movie, we don't see it run after our main cast of characters. It just walks after them because, according to the cast of characters in that movie, the top speed of a T Rex is four miles an hour, which is just silly. And sorry for going off on a tangent there, but I think you got my point. And speaking of the Giganotosaurus, my next big problem with the movie is the Giganotosaurus itself. Because outside of this movie, between the director, the advertisement for the movie, the filmmakers really try to hype up that the Giganotosaurus is the main threat of the movie. Yet, when you watch the movie itself, the Giganotosaurus barely appears in the movie. And when you do see the Giganotosaurus, it's either sleeping, casually walking, roaring at our characters, gets into some brief fights with the T-Rex, and then dies. That's it. It just seems like one big joke. And speaking of joke, I really do find it funny that the director of this movie compared the Giganotosaurus to the Joker from the Batman comics. Because these two have nothing in common. And I really don't see how the Giga source was supposed to be Joker-like at all. If anything, I feel that the Indominus Rex from the first Jurassic World movie was more like the Joker than the Giganosaurus was in this movie. Another problem that I have with the movie is the relationship between Owen and Claire. Because ever since the original Jurassic World movie, the filmmakers constantly try to establish that these two are a couple. And to me, the relationship they have with each other just doesn't work because they don't have good chemistry with each other. Seriously, I think Owen and Blue the Velociraptor have more sexual chemistry with each other other, as seen in these movies, than Owen and Claire do. And honestly, on top of the two characters not having any chemistry with each other, I just didn't think it was necessary for the two of them to even be a romantic couple in the first place. I think it would have been okay if in Jurassic World it's established that, yes, they used to be an item, but they were made friends. And if they went with that angle, I think it would have been for the best. And for the next problem that I have with the movie revolves around Blue and Beta, because much like the Giganotosaurus, the movie heavily advertises Blue and Beta to be a major part of the movie, but the two of them barely appear in the movie as it is, to a point that the movie didn't really even need to have them in there. Seriously, Blue the Velociraptor has a two minute cameo at best, who only shows up at the very beginning and at the very end of the movie, and even though Beta is a major plot device for the actual movie, you didn't need to have Beta be a plot device. You could have written her out of the movie and nothing would have changed. Seriously, during the last third of the movie when you have Owen, Dr. Grant, and Maisie trying to capture her, I straight up forgot Beta was even a thing because she had so little influence over the actual movie itself. Another problem that I have with the movie has to do with the climax because I think it's very anticlimactic in that sense where when you really look at it, you have a lot of good ingredients. Everything from our main cast of characters who are stuck in an environment that's set on fire, filled with dinosaurs that are trying to survive said forest fire, and to on top of that, not only could you have had multiple species of carnivorous dinosaurs chasing our main cast of characters, but you also could have had Dawson send a group of armed military soldiers to go after our main cast of characters, which could have resulted in this last third being very chaotic, but that's just it, nothing really happens. Which leads into another problem I have with the movie, is that this movie had several good ideas, but it doesn't take the opportunity to explore them. The first example being Maisie herself, because at the beginning of the movie, the filmmakers really tried to give the character some internal conflict, but it's only for two minutes, and I think what they should have done was give Maisie an existential crisis throughout the movie in terms of her trying to figure out not only who or what am I, but am I even a real person to begin with, but I think there should have been points where she should have also had Vietnam flags flashbacks of her being chased by the Indoraptor from Fallen Kingdom. As it is, Maisie is just a plot device and nothing else. Another example is the points in time when you see the cast of Jurassic Park interacting with the cast of Jurassic World. The conversations they have could have been better. For example, you have the tidbit where Dr. Grant looks like Owen and goes, Oh, you're the guy that trains the Velociraptors. Eh, try to. I feel like the two of them should have had more of a conversation because remember, Dr. 
Dr. Grant was really fascinated by the velociraptors in the original Jurassic Park movie. So here he is talking to a guy who's trained velociraptors. I feel like they could have had a lot of banter and shared some stories between the two of them, but we really don't get to see that. And I could keep going and list other examples, but I think you get my point. Which leads into another problem that I have with the movie, that being the advertising. Because of how misleading it is, because when you look at the general premise or the trailers, you're under the impression that the whole movie's going to be about mankind trying to figure out how do we live in a world filled with dinosaurs, and rather than that, we can or can't coexist with them. But when you watch the actual movie itself, we don't get that. Instead, we get a plot that's one part corporate conspiracy thriller, mixed with a giant killer bug movie, mixed with a Fast and Furious movie with dinosaurs sprinkled throughout it. And while I myself didn't necessarily have a problem with this, I understand where people are coming from. Because I think a lot of people were expecting something among the lines of the Jurassic World short film Battle at Big Rock, in which we see a family, while on a camping trip, witness a battle between a family of Necroceratops and an Allosaurus, which then leads to the Allosaurus attacking the family. And at the end of the short film, we get to also see various dinosaurs around the country interacting with people in various ways, both comical and terrifying. And I think if the movie went in that direction, I think it would have been for the better. Another problem I have with the movie, which can also be applied to Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, is that these movies, when they reference something from the original movie, it's very heavy-handed. In that sense where, when they reference something from the original movie, it's very on-the-nose, and it gets annoying after a while. And I know that Jurassic World did this too, but it didn't bother me there as much, because that movie was meant to be more of like a nostalgia cash-in on Jurassic Park. Whereas this and Fallen Kingdom, on the other hand, when they tried to reference scenes from the original movie, it just got annoyed. And the references in question I found to be very unnecessary since I didn't think they added anything to the plot. For example, the Barbasol can that Dawson gives to Dennis Nedry. That's something that not only did I think didn't need to show up in the movie, but it also raises questions such as why does Dawson have that Barbasol can and how did he get it? As it is, it's just an easter egg that raises questions that doesn't supply answers that didn't need to be in the movie whatsoever. And before I proceed with my final verdict on the movie, I have to first talk about my thoughts on the extended cut in terms of whether or not it helped benefit the movie or not. Personally, I think the extended cut in general does improve some aspects of the movie, such as the pacing that first third, because in the theatrical cut, it's very, as I mentioned earlier, it just goes from one scene to the next. There's no real flow to it. With the extended cut, they actually add some scenes that not only add a much slower or pace to that first third, but they also add scenes that provide context for certain points throughout the movie, such as the tidbit after Owen hog ties that one dinosaur. We see what happens afterward, because as the theatrical cut sits, we don't know why he's doing this in the first place. And later, he says, Maisie was kidnapped by a group of poachers that I spotted a couple days ago or something. And, you know, as someone who saw the theatrical cut in the theaters, also there's a presumption, okay, sometime in between Fallen Kingdom in this movie, he met a group of poachers. And the extended cut they actually add more context because not only does it provide why he's hog tying dinosaurs, but we also see him confronting that group of poachers in question, leading to certain events throughout the movie. And it also adds in that really beautiful prologue that was never on the theatrical cut. Because originally there was this prologue that was supposed to be attached to the movie, but was cut for some reason. And that prologue definitely helps benefit some aspects of the movie. Because the way it opens up, I wish we could just have a two hour movie of just dinosaurs dinosaurs living their life without any humans whatsoever, and I'd be happy with that because there's no narration, it's just the camera showing what's going on on screen. And if you ever heard the age-old say, show, don't tell. And you get everything that happens within this prologue, when it's just focused on the dinosaurs. And not only that, the tidbit what the dinosaurs actually 
foreshadows a lot of events that occur throughout the movies. For example, we see a herd of Necroceratops. Several minutes into the movie, we see Claire and a few others rescuing a baby Necroceratops in a facility that's illegally breeding them. Another example is the introduction of the Quintilatulus. Later in the movie, we have a Quintilatulus attacking an airplane that has Claire Owen and that pilot on it. But most importantly, it provides a lot more context between the T-Rex and the Giganosaurus, establishing a rivalry between these two apex predators. And not only that, it also gives the T-Rex a lot more screen time throughout the movie. Because in the theatrical cut, we only see the T-Rex maybe twice throughout the entire movie, and even then the T-Rex doesn't appear until more than an hour into the movie. With the extended cut, by adding that prologue back in, it gives the T-Rex more screen time. And not only that, but the movie has these motifs that connect to the end in the visual sense, because the movie begins with a sunset and ends with a sunset. There's a point in time where we have a close-up of the T-Rex's eye. Near the climax of the movie, we have a close-up of the T-Rex's eye. So on and so forth. A lot of recurring visual motifs that foreshadow the events of the movie. And there's even a scene that has Dawson interacting with one of the characters, and we get a better sense of their relationship between between each other. I thought that was pretty good. But other than that, there are just some scenes that occurred throughout the movie that I didn't think needed to be there, such as Blue the Velociraptor attacking a duo of hunters, or a tidbit where Owen's talking to Malcolm and he's talking about how there was this one time his dog humped his leg so much that he had to wear a cast on his leg. Those, I think, could have been cut. But overall, I think the extended cut definitely helps improve upon the movie in some ways. And even though it does improve upon it, it's still the exact same movie. So for my final verdict of Jurassic World Dominion, when comparing this movie to some of the other installments of the Jurassic World trilogy, this, in my opinion, is the weakest of the bunch. But when compared to the rest of the Jurassic Park franchise, again, while I definitely consider it to be one of the weaker installments, I don't think it's the worst installment. And as the movie sits by itself, I think having two different starlines focused on the cast of both the original Jurassic Park and the Jurassic World movies happening at the same time was not neat idea, and even seeing the cast of Jurassic Park interacting with the cast of Jurassic World was pretty neat to see. And the points in time where you have our main cast of characters interacting with the dinosaurs throughout the movie, I thought were entertaining. That said, however, the movie does suffer from some pacing issues, a very lengthy runtime, and the story needed a few more rewrites because the movie had a great idea on pen and paper, but instead of focusing on the idea of humans trying to coexist with dinosaurs, it decided to focus on the locusts, which I think is very unfortunate. And even though I think the extended cut of the movie does make some improvements over the theatrical cut, it still has the same problems that the theatrical cut has. So overall, Jurassic World Dominion is the Rise of Skywalker of the Jurassic Park franchise, but I would honestly watch this over Rise of Skywalker any day of the week. And before I give my final rating, what did everyone else have to say? say about Jurassic World Dominion. Alright, so, like I said, the movie got generally negative reception, and while I understand the movie's got problems, I don't think it's that bad. And so, for my final rating of Jurassic World Dominion, I give it a 3 out of 5. And if you're wondering what rating I would give the extended cut of the movie, honestly, I too would give it a 3 out of 5. Because, even though it does add a lot of new material, it does benefit the movie. In some ways, it's still the exact same movie. Although, that said, given that this was meant to serve as the conclusion to this very well beloved franchise, and given that I just talked about Star Wars a few moments ago, which movie do you think concluded the franchise the best? Jurassic World Dominion or Star Wars Episode 9: The Rise of Skywalker? And see you later.